Good morning, black people. Good morning. I hope you guys are having a wonderful day. Welcome, welcome, welcome to drboystv.com, the home for intelligent black people. My name is Dr. Boyce Watkins. As you come into the chat, uh, let me know what city you're coming from. Um, I see Greg Simmons has already come in and made a comment. Your comment has been seen and acknowledged. But today's topic is too much fun for me to walk away from it because I think uh, stuff like this is a lot of fun. Uh, this is the kind of stuff that um, every now and then I say, you know what, let me go ahead and uh, and, and have conversations. I, I don't back away from any debate. Um, I can debate with scholars. I can debate with uh, people from the street. I can debate with uh, everything in between. And, uh, and also, uh, and more importantly, uh, with these debates, I can also acknowledge areas where uh, I might be incorrect or areas where uh, I can grow or areas where <clears throat> where I learn something. So uh, so I think this uh, interesting conversation uh, it, it involves this comedian by the name of Corey Holcomb. You guys may not know Corey Holcomb, but Corey Holcomb is really damn funny. He's a, he's a very good comedian, actually. Uh, he's a little on the ratchet side. And uh, he also um, from a character standpoint, uh, you know, he, he has some things I think that he should work on. Uh, and uh, I'm going to address some of that. But uh, I wanted to address this topic kind of directly because uh, I think a lot of people felt that uh, that, you know, maybe it's beneath me or that I'm not going to talk about it. And, and uh, you know, I'll, I'll really talk about almost anything like there's there's not a lot uh, that I won't address, especially if it connects to some sort of core issue. Uh, in the black community. And uh, as a black man, I've been a black man my whole entire life now. I feel that black men have to talk to other black men about what manhood actually looks like. Uh, and in fact, that's why I, one of the reasons I wore this shirt today uh, is because uh, I want to just remind us that entertainers are not our leaders, right? So a lot of times we think that because somebody got uh, money from white people or they got a record deal or they tell funny jokes or they are in a movie, that that person is automatically a black leader. And they're not not really a black leader. They're actually a um, uh, they maybe to some extent might be called a mascot or something like that. You know, again, not that every entertainer is stupid, but this is this is what it is. Right. So Charmaine says, uh, I was hoping you would not respond to him. Let me just say this. If you don't want to hear the response, uh, it's OK to go away and say, you know what, I'll come back later. Uh, but I think the response is I, I, I encourage you to stick around, though, just because uh, you just because you respond doesn't mean it has to be a fight. Right. Just because uh, you respond to niggatry doesn't mean you have to be a nigga, right? Do you understand what I'm saying? Give me a yes if you follow what I'm saying. Uh, and so, uh, you know, Corey, uh, I know I, I know guys like Corey. You know, I grew up around guys like Corey. I have uncles and cousins, you know, they kind of fit that category. And I debated with them, and I, and I would debate with him too. I would talk to him on the phone if he wanted to call me. And uh, and I think also it's really important uh, to talk about this because – because I kind of want to, I kind of want to, I, I saw the video, I told my wife and my wife did the same thing. If you're telling me not to talk about it, then, then you're, you, you're in agreement with my wife. My wife was like, she just rolled over like whatever boys, you know, like, you know, cause, cause, you know, cause there's like weird stuff. People say like, well, she didn't really want to marry him. She really, if you look at her body language, she didn't want to marry And she's like, boys, I put on the ring as soon as, as soon as you propose, what would make people think I didn't want to marry you? And, and we've been married, by the way, we're doing good. We've been married for years and all that, I guess over two years now. And, um, but, but it's really funny. Right. And so I really kind of wanted to talk about it because, um, and number one, it addresses some core issues that, um, that I think we have to deal with in our community. Number two, uh, ironically, believe it or not, as much as you might think that this is not, uh, or you may be surprised by this, I actually think Corey's funny. I've laughed at his jokes before. I really actually have. Um, <clears throat> and then number three, I think it's important as black men that we talk about black love and some of the myths, some of the negativity, or I call it negativity, that has spread like a virus in terms of how we talk about our women, right? So, uh, so for those of you who say, you know, boys, you, you shouldn't address this, you shouldn't address this. Uh, maybe three years ago, I would have agreed with you. Uh, that's why, for example, when Kwame Brown uh, literally did ten videos in a row, I didn't say one single thing in response. Uh, actually, I wish I had responded a little more. I responded one time. I did one video called "The Truth About Kwame Brown," and I probably should have done about three. Because uh, what you have to do, you have to understand this. This is an educational process. It's like if you're trying to fix uh, pollution, you can't say, well, we're not going to address pollution. You know, if you're trying to fix the environment, you can't say, well, we're not going to go anywhere where the air quality is bad. Do you get what I'm saying? You know, if you say uh, we want to fix poverty, well, you can't say, well, I, I'll fix poverty, but I'm going to stay away from poor people because poor people are dirty and scary. Or we're going to fix homelessness, but don't bring a homeless person around me because I, I want to fix homelessness from my office. You can't do that. 
You all get what I'm saying? I hope you I hope some of you at least get what I'm saying. And I hope you'll trust me when I say that I promise you that this will be a beneficial conversation, uh, because, again, I, I, it's not really so much about the celebrities or the influencers or the, the people that are on TV or, or even people on the Internet. It's really more so about you. And if I don't see a teachable moment in a conversation, I'm not going to have it. OK, so anyway, do me a favor. Hit the thumbs up button. Thumbs up, thumbs up, share, subscribe. Also reminded this podcast is on Spotify. So if you look up Boyce Watkins on Spotify, you'll find it there. All right. So uh, what I want to do is uh, there is a uh, there is a YouTube channel run by a guy. It's called the Do Better Podcast run by a guy. I think the, I think his name I think I'm not sure, but I think his name is like Mr. Goodbread. And he talks a lot about relationships and women and stuff like that. I don't know the status of his own relationship situation. Uh, maybe he talks about it, but he should. If he's going to talk about relationship stuff, he should probably uh, show some evidence that his relationships are where he wants them to be. Right. That they're in a good place. Um, and also that it's uh, in a healthy place. Right. Because one of the things that um, that I think men you got to really kind of balance is that a lot of your uh, YouTube advice that you get on uh, dating relationships and women and everything else is all about how to be a player, you know, how to have 18 bitches and whatever, you know, people say, you know, whatever, right? How to how to have a girlfriend in every city and how to get sex whenever you want. And I think that's cool. But I also think that you should get the other side of that conversation. As black men, you got to get the other side. Somebody has to explain to you uh, the benefits of, say, being you know in love with a woman that is, is going to have your back or explain to you some of the downside of of what happens when you are engaged with a lot of different women. If you mess with a lot of different women, uh, you're going to end up having some problems, major problems, major, major problems. I'm talking about diseases. I'm talking about financial problems. I'm talking about emotional problems. And uh, and in fact, actually, one of the first things I'll point out, and I'm actually going to take some of the clip from Corey. And literally, I, I'd like to kind of analyze it and break it down one by one, especially especially things, you know, when you talk about, you know, speculating on my marriage. I don't know why uh, so many men, so many men decided to gossip about my marriage. It's very weird, like chatty patty ish, like why are you worried about whether or not my marriage is good or not. Like, what is, where's this coming from? It's not coming from me because I never told you anything about my marriage. Um, and, uh, and if, you know, and, and I, I think that that's something worth addressing just out of, out of honor for my respect for my wife, just to kind of say, no, no, she wanted to marry me. If she didn't want to marry me, she would have said no. And I knew she wanted to marry me because you don't just in case y'all don't want in case you want to know, you should not propose to a person if you don't know if they're going to say yes. Hey, just give me a yes if you hear what I'm saying. You never propose <laughs> if you don't know the answer in advance because, you know, you can get embarrassed that way. So um, so 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 one of the things I, I would definitely say on this is that uh, I think that there needs to be balance. I think that for black men, um, unfortunately, the, the the types of men that get elevated to you, that get promoted publicly are not the kinds of men that can really lead a community. Uh, uh, in fact, actually, well, there's one point in the video where Corey explains why he wished death on the mother of his child. He talks about that. He talks about why he wished death on his baby's mom. And I know why he did. He said it. Well, first of all, he says it because um, he, he, he wanted the shock value. He was hoping this would be one of those edgy jokes. You know, comedians take chances. And I respect that. Right. They, they, they say things that might get them slapped. They say things that might get them banned. And that is kind of the challenge for comedians. They, and they defend each other's right to freedom of speech. That's why, for example, so many comedians rallied around Chris Rock when Will Smith slapped him. They rallied around him because there is a fundamental tenet within among comedians that says uh, we should be allowed to say whatever we want. Right. And not not be slapped, not be banned, not be canceled or whatever. So he was being edgy. Right. He's being edgy. Ha ha. I wish death on my baby's mama. Da, 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 da. And I was like, OK, number one, that's just not appropriate because you got to remember black men pay attention to other black men. A lot of men don't have role models, so they look up to men that they see on TV. They look up to men that they see in Hollywood. So uh, so you got to understand the trickle down effect. When I see a guy I admire say, I wish my baby mama was dead, then I'm a young guy. And I say, yeah, I wish my baby mama was dead, too. Or or you think about what happened in Chicago, where, where Corey's from Chicago, right, where this guy is punching Anybody saw that where the guy was punching a black woman in her face, like hitting her, like just you say one more thing, I'm going to knock you out. You say one more thing, I'm going to knock you out. Not to say that Corey caused this, not to say that Corey uh, condones any of this, but you need to understand the trickle down effect. It's almost like how when uh, when all those people stormed the Capitol and they they went, you know, when people talk about Donald Trump's role in people storming the Capitol. Well, Trump didn't storm the Capitol himself. But he gave the word, wording and the language, and he had, he used his influence to 
uh, to, to get people to storm the Capitol, right? So his words did play a part in people's actions. So the same way Trump's words played a part in the actions of people that stormed the Capitol, I think of Corey Holcomb or anybody, any your favorite rapper, entertainer, whatever, their words have an impact. That's why, for example, down in Atlanta, you have rappers that are on trial for some of the lyrics that they they use in their in, in you know in their songs. You know, where they like, okay, I shot somebody last week, and then the FBI is like, okay, let me go investigate and see who got shot last week, and we can find out if you're connected to this crime. Or uh, the rapper Lotto right now, I think her full name is Mulatto. She's being sued right now uh, because uh, she, I guess somehow she allegedly endorsed. The uh, this uh, thing called the plastic challenge where people put themselves in plastic and try to break out and somebody died. And so she's being sued for two point seven million dollars. So anyway, uh, do me a favor. Uh, hit the thumbs up button. Thumbs up, thumbs up, share, subscribe. And uh, and I'm going to tell you what uh, I, I know. Some of you uh, are here are here to hear what I hear the conversation. Some of you uh, may not. This may not be your thing. And if it's not your thing, uh, you definitely this you may you may want to turn away for this one. You may not want to watch this one. Uh, and it's totally OK. All right. So let, let's go. Let's go into this. Let's let's let me share uh, my screen and let me know if you guys, guys can hear this. Give me a yes in the chat if you can hear. Uh, this video. Uh, I'm about to share a video from the channel from um, uh, the Do Good, uh, Do Better, the Do Better podcast. And uh, and I, I think that guy's Mr. Goodbread. I don't know his name, but, but by the way, if you watch this video, man, if you want to ever have a conversation with me one on one or debate with me, I'd be happy to debate with you. Um, I, I don't shy away from debates. I actually enjoy it because I'm not threatened by other ideas. And I, I definitely love learning from other people. So here is uh, somewhat Corey said. and I'm going to kind of pause it and let me know first. Give me a guess if you can hear. Let me know if you can hear this. OK, here we go. I just want to say, um, Mr. Watkins, you you need to you need to understand the position you in. Hey, do we can we do we really had a video put up? Okay. Show me this video. Okay, first of all, give me a yes if you can hear that. Can you hear it? You can hear it okay? Okay, good. Thank you. All right, here we go. Go. Y'all see this shit? You ain't even gotta say shit first. Can the can the people see that? Do you see her hesitation? First of all, this is a lady he know. For a long time. I said lady. I do not know this lady. I have nothing against her. I just only understand her hesitation. It's obvious in the video. <laughs> Look how she looking. Look how she looking. He okay, so let me pause it right there. Um, my wife and I, we did talk about that. And I said, people think that based on how you were standing, they speculate that you did not want to marry me. And she, she was kind of surprised by that. And uh, it actually, if you watch the video, the, the full video of the proposal is online uh, and you can see the first thing she does when I give her the ring is she puts it on her, her finger. Right. So her disposition was really shock and surprise. I, I had spent the whole day, just so you all know <clears throat> what happened that day. I spent the whole day planning uh, to propose to her exactly where we met when I was 22 years old. And so we went for a run and I said, hey, let's go visit the old place, the, the cafeteria where I met you, you know, when I when I was in grad school. And so we went there and that's when I made the proposal to her. I handed my camera to this brother that was standing nearby. He didn't know he was going to be filming the proposal. And uh, that was my way of kind of surprising her. I was real nervous. I was nervous all day that I was going to lose the ring, that I was going to do it wrong or whatever. I, one thing I was not nervous about, one thing I was not worried about at all was her saying no. And, uh, and this is a little tip for anybody that ever proposes marriage to somebody, especially when other people are around. Never, ever propose. It, ne don't really ask any significant question. <laughs> Never ask that question unless you know the answer. <laughs> don't do that. Don't leave it up to chance. So uh, so in that situation, I we, we kind of just thought it was hilarious that there were people who thought that somehow she was hesitant or didn't want to marry me because, it, number one, if she didn't want to marry me, I would have known that and I would never would have proposed. Or two, she would have just said no. OK, she's able to say you know, she's able to say no to things she does not want to do. And uh, and so, you know, the speculation, I know some of you may have seen the speculation, some of you may not. But uh, I think I think hearing it from me and hearing exactly what actually happened will be better than hearing like gossip on the Internet from people who've never met me or never had a conversation with me. I find that all very, very strange. All right. So let me uh, share my screen. Let's keep going. Let's keep going down the video because I think I think this is uh, this is a fun topic. So I, I I don't get to talk about stuff like this a lot. A lot of times I got to pretend like I'm taking the high ground and ignore everything. But I don't want to do that. I, I, I respect these guys. I want to have the I want to have this conversation. If they ever want to have me on 5150 or they want to have me on. Um, what is this? Uh, uh, Mr. Goodbread's podcast. I'd be happy to go on there. I would defend every single thing I've ever said or ever done. I love defending it because it comes from a place of honesty and uh, 
and and what I believe to be correct at the time. So uh, I don't have any problem defending my ideas. I'm not running away from nothing. So here we go. We've known this lady 20 plus years, and she had a, a child elsewhere before she agreed to marry him because can y'all stop the video for a second? Just okay, stop. let's talk about that. Let's talk about, uh, and this is, and I'm explaining to you why it's important to have this conversation. You got to address the niggerosity. You have to address the niggerosity in your community. You can't just act like it's not there. Um, you know, there, there's this weird thing, and I, and I had, and this was why I had a challenge with Kevin Samuels. I like Kevin Samuels, and I said, look, man, I hate the idea. Because Kevin supported me. Kevin did a whole video about me. And uh, and he was he was actually supportive when he did the video. So I felt kind of bad. But I said, I got to tell the truth. Stop acting like black children are a goddamn nuisance. Stop acting like black children are some sort of liability that gets in the way for you getting more vagina. Like, seriously, that's, you know, well, I, I'll go. I'll show up and I'll sleep with the girl. But I don't want nothing to do with them monk, monkey ass little children. These fucking goddamn kids getting in my way. I can't get no pussy and smoke my weed and get my liquor and my women. Because cause these little niggas are getting in the way. I hate that. I absolutely hate it. I think it is the most embarrassing. Pathetic and ridiculous behavior that a black man can have look man if you don't want to date a woman with kids don't do it if children because i'm gonna tell you about children <clears throat> let me tell you about black children children in general children require patience some of y'all ain't got the patience to handle kids i get it uh it requires uh, you to engage in the really difficult and unfortunate act of giving a fuck about someone other than yourself um, it requires a little bit of bread. Mr. Good bread would understand that if you got good bread, he knows that children require bread. Um, it's not easy. I get it. <clears throat> and also one thing we have to understand about, and people ask, well, why would you talk about this? And I keep having to remind everybody, I talk about this stuff because this is directly related to economics. Black economics is in the toilet because your men are fucked up. A lot of your men, look at what black women are doing economically and educationally. They're killing it. And black men, because society has mistreated us and pushed us to the side, we are justifying extreme niggatry. We justify the guy who sits around smoking weed all day, who don't want to be bothered. We justify uh, men who become alcoholics and, and a complete nuisance to their families. We justify irresponsible behavior. Now, I'm not trying to say there's not a reason for it. The white man has consistently tried to have his foot on your neck for the last 400 years. So so we know where it comes from. It's white supremacy everywhere. White supremacy is everywhere. But there's a point where um, if you don't start talking about these issues, then you're always going to have these problems. The breakdown of the black family is is in part, not completely, but in part driven by the fact that the black man has been broken down. OK, so here's my point on this. If you're 29 years old and you're thinking about taking on a family, that is a different discussion from when you're 49 years old. When I was 49, I had enough money. And also I consider raising black children to be an honor and an opportunity to influence somebody who's going to be significant in my community. Um, I can't consider myself pro-black if I don't love the women and the children in the, in the black community. Uh, the black community, um, the children are your future and the women give birth to your future. So when so what does trigger me is this idea that you think you can be pro black and wish death on the mother of your kids. Um, I get it. I know you're mad. You're frustrated. There's a whole lot of craziness. Cor Corey's not happy with his personal life. You could tell because he talks about that. He talks about now. Pay attention now. You know, listen, think, think about this. There are a lot of young men who are getting relationship advice from men who are very unhappy in their personal lives. Why in the fuck would you? get advice from somebody who's obviously not happy with their personal life choices. Now I get it. If it's, it's, if it's one thing, like I had uncles like Corey and cousins like Corey who would say, man, you know, they'd be sitting there with a bottle in one hand and a joint in the other. And they'd be like, man, don't, don't, don't do what I did, man. Don't you ever do, don't, don't, don't be, don't be like me. Don't mess up like me. Those were, those were wise men because they understood that their choices weren't the best and they wanted me to do better. But when you have men that, believe falsely that their choices were the right ones and it seems validated because white folks have given them money 
or maybe that person's on TV or that person's on the radio or that person has a record deal. That's part of what's destroying your community. Pay attention. Think about it. Now, I'm not saying Corey's in this category, but if you remember DMX, everybody knew DMX was going to die 20 years before he died. Give me a yes if you understand where I'm coming from. Everybody knew that DMX was not going to live past the age of maybe 45. Everybody knew that. People knew that when he was 35. Um, everybody knew that R. Kelly was eventually going to end up dying in prison. He, they, everybody knew at some point his life, his choices were all going to catch up with him. Now, this is funny. This is actually out of Chicago where Corey's from. You know, everybody knew that. But what made it seem OK? Why do people still look up to him? Why do people still consider him to be some sort of successful, upstanding individual? Well, because he had money, because he was on TV, because he's doing concerts and because because ladies like him. Right. So so what I need you to really understand is or gain the ability to dissect the fame from the person's character that is actually in the position of fame. We don't do that. We assume that if you're rich and famous, that that must mean you're a good man. You're a good catch. You're a successful black man. But a lot of the most so-called successful men that get the most visibility, the most you know, sell the most records, whatever are highly dysfunctional, incredibly unhealthy people. If you don't believe me, go talk to their children. Go listen to their children and 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 you know and or their or their families and look at their life situation. You know, and so so black, the black man is one of the few um categories in America because they see you as a clown or an athlete or you know or as a um or as an entertainer. Uh we're one of the few groups of people where the most dysfunctional among us get elevated to become the leaders of the community because they don't want your little boys to grow up to become anything that becomes a threat. Okay. So, uh, so the reason I speak on this issue is because I think that you have to look a threat in his face. Um, you know, I know that people, uh, there are people that would say, Oh, don't do that. He's a comedian. He's going to roast you. Jokes don't scare me. Like I don't, I'm a man jokes. I, you can tell a joke and I'll laugh with you. I'll be like, yeah, you're right. My feet are big. Ha ha ha. You big foot. Nigga. <laughs> that is funny. <laughs> okay. Now what? At what point do you get past <clears throat> the jokes and start becoming a man? At what point do you get past the jokes and actually start being serious? Because one of the things that I need smart black men and smart black women to understand, some people ain't going to get it. I know. I know there's probably people in the chat. I'm not even looking, honestly, at the chat, but I'm sure there's people in the chat that are like, like, man, you a simp. You a whatever. Okay, fine. Say all that. That's cool. But one of the things I need you to understand is that it is your commitment to jokes and and always ha ha he he that makes your whole entire community a joke give me a yes if you understand the black community is not seen as any sort of threat they're not seen as any sort of competition they're not seen as any sort of um uh, of stable entity you're not respected by anybody you go around the world and they call you niggas in other countries because they're like oh of course those people like to be called niggas because they call each other niggas all the time and, uh, and and I would just tell you, I, I, I really think it's black people. We got to really analyze that. And and so I'm going to throw myself on the cross and be the guy who who, who does that. I'm going to be the guy who just says, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, let's 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 have this conversation. So let me play more of the video uh, so that uh, so we can really analyze this. So let's see here. I'm going to play a little bit more. Uh, let me share my screen. Hold on. Give me a second. Do me a favor, hit the thumbs up button, thumbs up, share, subscribe. By the way, my new book is called The Ten Commandments of Black Economic Power. It's available on Amazon if you want to take a look. And also, I want everybody to know, including both of these guys on both of these shows, that if you ever want to have me on for a debate, I'd be more than happy to come on the show. I would stand by every single thing I've ever said, uh, and I will listen to you and hear everything that you have to say. Okay, uh, so let's let's keep going. Let, here we go. All right. Stop it. I just want to, I just want to say something. Something that I, I I want the, the crew to, to 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 especially Darlene. I want to see what she got to say about this. I want to let all you guys five eight and under know this. <laughs> Women prefer to have children with bigger guys. Salute to all my short kings out there. Guys with height. So, Mr. Watkins, I want you to know, she didn't have a baby with you. You got her when her she was finished and when you was finished. But you you a meal ticket for it. That's why I believe that this woman decided to say All right. So I do it cuz her body So so let let's stop there. Okay. So Corey says you um a couple of things. Number 1, he says uh you were a meal ticket for her. And um 
and and again that fits when sometimes when people talk about that what they see in your relationship that's really a reflection of what they see in their own relationships um i think that Corey, because he's in in the entertainment space he probably runs into a lot of low vibration gold digging you know nasty ass women he does he probably does right because i've been in la where Corey lives and um and i remember the time i was in la and i met him and when i was in la i had desperate uh beautiful beautiful women but very desperate actresses that wanted to get next to me because i had money and status and and they saw people clapping when i walked in the room so they thought that okay i want to get next to this guy um i was really shocked by that you know and i remember thinking you are a beautiful girl like you know where's your father like your father you shouldn't be in the la starving your father should be helping you out sending you money putting you in a position of strength but most of them didn't have daddies and a lot of them were desperate to be successful famous whatever so when they see a guy you know and again Corey has status he's a good comedian you know he's, he's people know him and i like i like i like i, I watch Corey. I, I laugh i really my wife doesn't think he's that funny but i do i think i think he's funny um so these are the types of women that Corey deals with. Now, let me explain my world and the types of women that I saw when I was single. Um, I didn't see low vibration gold diggers. You know, when, uh, why? Well, because I, I don't market myself to low vibrational gold diggers. Uh, I market. I the first thing I say when I come in this platform is this is for intelligent black people. That means that about 70 percent of the black community is going to say, oh, well, that must not be for me because our self-esteem is not that high. I'm not saying that you have to have education or wealth or anything like that. I'm just saying you have to value intelligence. And to explain to you how backward our culture is. Think about this. You have millions of people watching the BET Awards, which was about the most raggedy, ratchet ass, ghetto ass shit that you've ever seen in your life. Give me a yes if you saw any of the craziness that was there. I'm talking about pregnant women twerking with 85 tattoos on their belly, like just with a liquor bottle and one and with a hand. And, 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 because, because again, they get offended when you break break down things like fetal alcohol syndrome and how many millions of our kids can't even think right because their mama was popping up the cavassier while she was pregnant with the baby. Like we y'all don't the, the thing is that when you bring this up. People think, oh, you're being uppity. You're being uppity. And I'm like, well, maybe we need to be a little bit uppity because you're being downity. You're being real downity right now. You're being real low vibe. Like you really want black people scraping the bottom of the barrel. So so here's my thing. When Corey made that statement, oh, you're her meal ticket, without, again, without knowing anything about my wife's financial situation when she married me, that speaks to the types of women that he's run into. Maybe that's why he has problems with his baby's mamas, because maybe that's the type of women he attracts. Women that say, I want to be with you because I want to get your money. Well, just understand, I'm a financial expert. I can spot a gold digger from a mile away. I have people coming from me in every direction asking for money. It happens even to this day, even as a married man. I have people, hey, doc, I got, can, I, can, you, can you invest in this? I need money for that. Blah, blah. Okay, we get all that. Well, here's the thing. As a financial expert, do you think that I would want to um, connect with a woman that was trying to get access to my money? Um, I was going, I was having conferences around the world and meeting beautiful women that, you know, were shooting their shot. Most of those beautiful women were not in the in the Corey Holcomb groupie category. Uh, these were women who read books. These were women who have advanced degrees. These are women that make six figures. These are women who put money in their 401ks. These, some of these were women who had inheritances. So my wife already had plenty of money before we got married. You know, and and, uh, and now, mind you, I'm going to say this too, though. I didn't care how much money she had. That's where, that's where Kevin Samuels was 100% correct. Most men that have money don't care how much money your, a woman has. So when a woman says, I want a man with six figures because I make six figures, that doesn't even make any sense because a lot of men that make six figures don't care if you make six figures. They just don't, you know? So, so, so my point is to say that, um, that his statement is more of a reflection of his mindset. The anything. It's like, if he said, well, the reason she got with you is because she want to pull out the strap and shoot you in the toe. You'd be like, well, what kind of people do you hang around that would shoot you in the toe? You know, like, so, so really that, so that, that's the point I want to make on that. Um, that's the first point. The second uh, thing that he mentioned, uh, he mentioned something else. Let me, there was something else I, I wanted to kind of uh, break down because I want, I want you to really understand what's happening in your community. This is why 
I'm talking about this issue with Corey Holcomb, because I really want you to understand just, you know, the black male immaturity and why this is destroying us because 50 year old black men should not be talking like this anyway. Like this is only in your community where a lot of your boys look up to men like this. And that's why they don't turn into men. That's why they, we have the family problems we have, but let, let me play this. Hold on. You, you a meal ticket for it. That's why I believe that this woman decided to say, fuck it. I'll do it. Cause her body language is not that of a happy woman. Okay, yeah, that's what it was. It was not just the body language. We talked about that. Again, my wife, you know, she's like, no, boys. I, if I didn't want to marry you, I wouldn't have put the ring on my finger one second after you handed it to me. But the other thing was he talked about women being a, wanting to sleep with bigger guys, right? And, uh, and that part is partially true in the sense that women, I, I read, remember, I wrote a book uh, years ago called Financial Lovemaking. It's on Amazon if you want to go look at it. And one of the things that I became intrigued with was biology and what women are attracted to. And a lot of you guys, you call women gold diggers if they if they want a man that has more money. But they're not that doesn't make her automatically a gold digger. There are gold diggers out there, but uh, there's a natural attraction that women have to security. Uh, women tend to, on average, uh, want a man maybe that's taller, stronger. But also there are other ways. This is hope for you short guys out here, too, because uh, I'm a short guy. I'm five foot. I'm, I'm less than five, eight. Um, uh, they also want men, they, 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 they see other forms of security as important too. Like if you have power, uh, if you are intelligent, if you have lots of money and also actually, if you're funny, even being funny is appealing to women because, uh, comedy is a type of intelligence. So Corey, I'm not here to say Corey's not an intelligent man. I'm not saying that at all. He's a brilliant comedian, right? So, um, so, so we're just brilliant in our own ways, right? So, so really, if you are a guy and you're trying to figure out how do I make myself a high value man, well, find one of those categories where you can fit in. All of us can't be over six feet tall. And so, in fact, ladies, when you say you want a man over six feet tall or a man, and a man who makes a, you know, above a certain amount of money, you really are thinning out the herd. And it's very important, I think, that you also remember that there are other ways for a man to show his strength than just being tall and rich. Right. If he's intelligent, if he loves the shit out of you and has your back, uh, that that's a that's a really powerful. Uh, if he um, you know, if he's if he has goals and ambition, if he's you know, if he reads books, like all these things are important. Right. And there are women uh, who have different preferences that they have. Right. So. Uh, so, for example, I have um, when I was like 20 years ago, when I was single, I was like 29. I remember uh, doing online dating. That was the last time I was able to do online dating because after that, people knew who I was. So I, it wouldn't work anymore. And uh, more than a couple of times, I remember hearing women that would just instantly say, well, I'm sorry, I don't date men under six feet tall. And um, I think it's their right. I think everybody has a right to want what they want. But I remember thinking, wow, like you don't even know anything about me and you're, and you're not even that tall. You're only five foot five, but it's their right to have a preference. But the other thing too, that you have to understand, and this is on, um, you know, talking about dating, really actually from a mathematical standpoint, the more, and this is true of mathematics, the more restrictions you put on your search, the the less optimal your outcome is going to be. And what does that mean? That means the more you restrain, the more you thin out the herd and are clearing out the pool, uh, the harder it's going to be for you to pick what you want. So if six feet tall is important, you can't come in and say, I want six feet tall. I want him to be rich. I want him to have no kids. I want him to have, you know, I want him to be super intelligent. Like, like if you, the more you name all these restrictions and you have this big list, the more likely you are to be single, you know, for the rest of your life. Same thing, you know, same thing is true for men too. So, but he is right. You know, I, um, there are women that like taller men. Uh, and uh, my, my wife's ex-husband's a very tall guy. He's a very nice guy. He's a great co-parent. We raised the kids together and I'm super proud of that. And this is this is something that I want you uh, guys to really hear, uh, so you'll hear other perspectives, right? You know, I, I don't want you to just hear it from the perspective of people that consider kids to be a nuisance. Um, I love those kids, I really do. And uh, also, how we choose our partner is affected by how we grew up. My father uh, took care of me when nobody else would. You know, when I was three, I had no father, and and a lot of the men who uh, think that fathers are a waste of time or fatherhood is a waste of time. A lot of those poor guys didn't have any fathers. So uh, remember, this is what's happening. This is the generational curse that you have in your community where a lot of people grow up without a dad and they grow up believing that dads are not important. So the father, the boy is like, well, I never had a father and I was fine. So my kids don't need a father. And, and those kids over there that where well, I'm not the, the daddy, they definitely don't need no father. And then you've got women that also believe 
that the fathers don't matter. So you have a whole strain of the black community that doesn't identify with fatherhood at all. You know, and, and Corey and I both have um, a, a, a mutual friend, uh, Willie D. Willie D is my, my buddy. He's my homeboy. He was in my wedding and all this stuff. I mean, we, we're real cool. But also Willie, um, I, I respect Willie because Willie is intelligent enough to see the value of all different perspectives. You know, Willie is the guy who doesn't follow the crowd. He's a leader. Um, I think he's the intellectual giant behind the creation of the ghetto boys. I, I, as I heard him tell stories about the ghetto boys and Bushwick and Scarface, I said, okay, so I get it. You were the catalyst. You were the playmaker because you were the ones that helped you help Bushwick understand that. Yeah, you actually can rap and here's how you can shape your persona. You help Scarface, you know, pick his name and all those other, right? So, so anyway, what I like about Willie's intelligence is that Willie's able to, um, yeah, he can understand, he understands the street, you know, he, he knows all of that. But he also understands little things that um, require him to understand where what generational curses need to be broken. You know, like I met Willie's son last time I was in Houston, and his son is different from him in certain ways. His son is not anywhere near the type of stuff Willie had to grow up with. And that in, in that regard, Willie, I think the reason we're friends and, and we're great friends is because Willie reminds me of my father. My father saw every single thing that the street can offer. He he saw. He, he saw the heroin addiction. He saw the killing. He's killed people. He, you know, robbing, stealing, all, all of that stuff. All that stuff was there. And he was a person that had enough vision to say, I don't want that for my kids. You know, and uh, and, then, and then he took me under his wing again because he, he could have been out getting women and getting money and, and smoking weed and hanging out. But he didn't. He said, I want this is my son. I'm going to take him under as my son. And uh, and he invested in me. And so the benefit of that is, number one, when my father got older, I paid off his whole house. I, he wanted a car. I bought him a car with cash. He didn't have a car note. If my father needs anything and he calls me right now, I'll be I'll drop this podcast right now and go take care of daddy. That's what that's 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 the kind of loyalty you get when you invest in black children. Right. And, and this is something that should be considered, uh, you know, when people just act like kids are a waste of time. They're not always going to be a waste of time. One day you're going to be old. They're going to be young. And they're going to be the ones who are controlling your fate. Uh, and so so and, and then if you didn't invest in them, they're not going to have any love for you. They're not going to care about you. But then the other piece to that, too, is uh, I, I saw where Willie put up a post where he said uh, that that his friends would say, I don't want no squares in my circle. And he said, I want squares in my circle, because if I have squares in my circle, I know that I'm not going to get pulled over on the dope charge or get locked, caught up in a Rico case or end up in prison. Right. And, and I and I said, that's that's just I, I, I identify with that, because what I'm saying is, you know, I think as black people, we got to try to do better, man. You know, I, I, a lot of us grew up in the middle of a lot of shit. A lot of us saw things that, that we shouldn't have seen. You know, I was born on Father's Day and my father was not even in the room. He was nowhere to be found. I, I don't know if he was off getting high. I don't know what the hell my daddy was doing, my biological father. And uh, I don't want that for my children. I don't want that for anybody's child. And so if you want to know my uh, the reason why I pr I'm very proud to raise kids that are not mine is because I don't want any child to be hurting. You know, any child that that needs the protection of a daddy, I feel like I'm supposed to provide that, you know, and, and I don't understand uh, why that seems like such a radical, strange idea. There are other communities where they totally get it. If I was Jewish. There'd be no controversy like, OK, Mazel Tov, Dr. Watkins, this is what we do in our community. Right. If I'm Asian, they're like, oh, that's so great. You know, this, you're, you're a great child. You're a proud Chinese man. But you get to the black community. It's like, oh, that nigga wasted his time with the damn kids. He a, he a simp. Wait, why you why you care about the black community? Why are you caring about children? Like, you know, and it's, it's weird to me. Right. So I'm just taking it upon myself and I'm having this conversation, which is not you know, comfortable for some of y'all. I know some of y'all are used to me just talking about other stuff and ignoring things like this. And sometimes I will, but every now and then I think it's time to confront the bullshit head on. Sometimes it's important for us and, and you know, and everybody ain't going to get it. I know that there's going to be a lot of chatty patty gossip and all that on the internet and that's fine. Uh, people can do that. That's, you know, they're, they're talking about me. I want them to talk about me. That's good. Um, but at some point as black people, you got to stand up, man. You got to say something. You can't let uh, somebody because they're cool or they they're they're popular sort of drive your community right off a cliff because there ain't nothing about 
any of the value systems that are being promoted by some of these really popular men. I'm not dissing Corey. This is not, I'm, I, I don't, I want to, and, and if he wants to call me, I'll talk to him on the phone. I'm not scared. I, there's not a single person I've ever critiqued on this platform that I would not have a direct one-on-one -on -one conversation with. And Corey, one thing Corey is hundred percent correct about is that sometimes my mouth gets me in, in, you know, caught up in some shit, right? I just, when I was a little boy, my, my mother used to say, boy, your mouth will either make you great or get you killed. I'm curious to see which one. And Cornell West, when I told him what my mother said, he said, it might be both. It might be both. And I said, yeah, because if I see something, I just can't help. It. I got to say something. And uh, in a couple of areas where that did cause me like some issues was um one was Angela Rye. I met Angela Rye uh, in Oklahoma. She was a complete bitch to everybody. She was mean as shit to everybody there. D very disrespectful. They were very hurt by that. And I felt the need to say something about it. And next thing you know, I didn't realize that Angela Rye was very close to Charlemagne. And I think that was, I think that was when uh, I, you know, I've been on the breakfast club like four or five times up until that point. I think at that point, that was when uh, you know, Charlemagne didn't need to, didn't know what, what to do with that. Right. Cause he did text me. He said, what's going on with you and Angela? Another example is, um, I, I, a few years ago, I said something about Umar Johnson that, uh, where Umar had, you know, had just been doing some stuff that was really out of pocket, very disrespectful. And I said something in the video, uh, it was watched by almost a million people and Umar is still mad at me to this day because of that. And I don't regret it, though, because I think sometimes some shit needs to be said and we need to stop being polite all the damn time and address the elephant in the room. Um, you know, truth be told, when I met Corey, I didn't like his energy. I, I admit it. I just I because I, I, I'm a little bit triggered by black men, especially when you're supposed to know better. You you in your 40s, you in your 50s, you know, you, you're supposed to present a maturity that our young guys can look up to. They're supposed to be able to look at you. I mean, I talk to young guys in their 20s and they're like, man, we don't know what to do when the men in their 50s are acting like kids, when they're trying to keep up with teenagers. And and uh, and I think that as black men, it's very important that we understand when you hit a stage where you're supposed to be the grown man, you're supposed to be the OG. You're not supposed to still say and do things at 45 or 55 that you did when you were 25 or, or 35. And so, um, you know, if that causes me problems, that's fine. Uh, I'm okay with that. You know, I, I I like myself, so I don't need other people to like me that much. But uh, also, I'm speaking to encourage those of you who do agree to you gotta you gotta stand up, you gotta speak up because if you don't, then you know, like if you look, think about it, what what would have happened if that guy in Chicago who beat the shit out of that lady? What if there were like real men there who didn't just want to film it and and say, oh my god, look at how hard he's hitting her? What if there were real men actually there who said, you don't do that to a black woman, you don't hit a, you don't hit a woman like that. You can get mad. And we know she we know she's she's yapping a lot, but that's not appropriate. That's not good behavior. But instead, we have a community where we kind of expect men to sit around and watch it happen. I don't really know if that would have happened in, like, say, the Orthodox Jewish community. I don't not to put them on a pedestal, but but I don't think that would. I don't know. I don't know how many times I've seen that happen, say, in uh, parts of Africa you know, or, um, or in Latin America, you got a, you know, a bunch of, uh, Colombian men standing around while one Colombian man is punching the shit out of a woman. I, I just don't know again, uh, not to stigmatize us, but I think that there is a kind of bitch, ad bitch acidness that as black men, we've kind of, um, allowed. And I think it's very important to kind of identify that and, and address that. So let me uh, let me just I'm going to finish up soon, but let me share a little bit more of Corey's video. I want to make sure he gets heard so we can hear this. And again, Corey, if you want to come in here, man, you can come on. You can come on my channel, man. I just want to make this public. You you are invited to come on my channel and uh, and we can talk it out or argue it out, whatever you want to do. Uh, you can also call me on the phone. I'll talk to you on the phone. Willie has your number. I don't, but I'll talk to you. Uh, Mr. Goodbread, the guy whose uh, channel I'm sharing, I will come on your channel or you can come on mine. We can all be friends. Just because we disagree don't mean we got to like uh, be, be scared to talk to each other. We don't have to talk about each other. We can talk to each other. So here we go. So I'm just letting you know, Mr. Watkins, you can say whatever you want to say about me, but you look like the ass clown right there. That's what you look like in that video. Look at your face. Look at her face. That, that is not. Okay. Let's pause right there. So, so think about this. This is what's crazy. Uh, so how did we get so deformed as a community that a black man, that there are men who would believe that a man is a clown for getting on his knee and proposing to a black woman? I mean, you know, I'm not a fan of all the 
uh, you know, all the women that have just kind of divested from the black community who just feel like, you know, black men are not as good as other men and they're marrying, you know, people like Prince Harry and stuff. I, I, I think we should stick with with our people. I really do. But think about this. The black woman is not honored in our in our community by some of the men. You know, um, I thought that getting on your knee to propose was what you were supposed to do if you really love a woman. You know, now I'm not on my knee for a stripper. I'm not getting on one knee for a prostitute. I'm not getting on one knee for a one night stand. I'm getting on one knee for the first time in my life because I wanted to communicate to this woman that you are so special. You are so significant that um, that I want the whole world to know how much I love you. And I know most men don't think this way. Right. So I think it's really important that we don't act like every black man does this. But the fact that me getting on one knee and and because I mean, he talks about facial expressions, but I don't understand how you would even know what I'm thinking based on what my face looks like. You know, in fact, at that moment, I probably had tears in my eyes because I never loved somebody that much. Uh, And also her facial expression was, you know, like surprise, shock. Right. Again, if you look, if you watch the video carefully, you'll see as soon as I gave her the ring, she slides it right on her finger. Uh, Again, a, a small little tip. Uh, never propose if you don't know the answer in advance. I knew exactly what the answer was going to be before I did that. You you never put yourself out there if you don't know what the lady's going to say. So let let's keep going. But let let's let's um share more of the video because I want I want I want to hear what Corey has to say because I, I like I, I like sort of helping break this down. Place, for some, especially a young woman guy. who feel like oh he finally did it. That's the woman's face that said, "Damn, I ain't got no more options." <laughs> Okay, so that's the woman's face that says, damn, I ain't got no more options. Okay, so um, what I want to do is uh, I want to show you all something. Do me a favor, hit the thumbs up button, thumbs up, share, subscribe. Uh, You're watching DrVoiceTV.com, the home for intelligent black people. Um, All right, so let me uh, let me ask you all. Let me throw up a little test. I'm going to do a little litmus test. So, So a lot of you all heard falsely from the late Kevin Samuels. You know, uh, you know, RIP to Kevin, but Kevin was wrong sometimes. It's, it's just the truth. Uh, he wasn't wrong about everything, but he was wrong about this, that somehow women over 35 are garbage and that nobody wants women over 35, which I think is the craziest crock of shit I've ever heard in my life. And I'm going to show you a picture of my wife. Here's my wife. Now, um, not to say that I would put this out there like that, but um, do you think that that looks like a woman who has no options like does that look like a woman who says i better grab the first man that comes along um or i'm going or ain't nobody never gonna want me like really does anybody that like is that an image i i mean I, i'm gonna sit here. I, I sit here and 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 look at my wife and i every day i think she's gorgeous and she works out uh five six times a week and and i i've seen her um you know when we were friends before i wanted to get married uh, many years ago, I would see her getting hit on by NBA players uh, with $10 million in the bank. She was not impressed. She was not impressed by athletes. Um, you know, I saw her getting hit on by dope dealers with big Mercedes Benzes and gold chains and shit. She didn't want that because she didn't want to be with a thug because um, she had a daddy. Now, let me tell you about my wife that's really interesting to me, which really impresses me with her. Um, part of the reason that my wife was never impressed by um, rappers and thugs and basketball players and all that other shit is because of her father. She has something most black women don't have, which was a daddy. And uh, her daddy was a professor like me. There's a book. I think, I don't know if it's a book or if it's an article, but it's called my father was my first boyfriend. And this is some game. This isn't some information. It's a lesson I want you all to kind of walk away with and understand. Most of us tend to pick our partners based on what our opposite sex parent actually did for a living. And let me tell you about my marriage. And I'm, I'm putting myself out there on this a little bit because I because I want people that that need guidance. Those especially young people that don't have anybody that's that's validating your your beliefs about the fucked up shit going on in your community. I'm I'm that guy who will stand up there. I'll take the arrows. I'll take the swords. I I don't care because I'm not scared of none of that. Um, 
But in this book, they explain that your opposite sex parent shapes what kind of person you're uh, you're going to choose. It does. So if your daddy, and this is why we all need therapy as black people, because if your daddy was a drug addicted thug and a loser and a bum, but you're trying to love him through all the bummery and, uh, you know, everything, else, all the fucked up shit that he did, then don't be surprised when you grow up and you're picking a man who is just like your dad. That That's the truth. Um, And here's the thing, because Joe Biden this is why I won't vote for this guy to this day, because Joe Biden put so many black men in prison and messed up so many men. And then also before that, they had Vietnam where so many men got hooked on drugs. A lot of your most famous, most celebrated black men who appear to be the most successful and have the most money are really terrible, terrible fathers. They're terrible husbands. They're not wired to love you. They can't love you. Because their friends are telling them, oh, you love a woman. If you honor a woman, if you get on your knee for a woman, you a simp. There is no other community. Give me a yes if you understand what I'm talking about. There is no other community where men are called simps because they love a black woman or because they love their woman, period. That makes you look crazy and stupid. In fact, there are white guys marrying black women now. I saw a video today. I kid you not of a white guy who married a black woman with black children. And in this video, the white guy was clowning black men and saying, you, you think I can't raise black boys? I raise them better than y'all do. You think I can't love a black woman? I love the woman better than you ever will. And then his black wife comes along and says, you call me a bed wench because I want a man that loves me and my kids? Fuck you. Like they didn't say it like that, but they literally did a thing where they were cocking a gun, like shooting the gun to say, screw you. So I'm just sitting here trying to tell you, this is my appeal to any self-respecting black person listening to this video, that you need to call out the nonsense before the world continues to make you look dumber than we look right now. We are not that stupid. We are not that weak. We are not that pathetic. The world turned you into whatever monstrosity that, the, that, that you've become in the public eye. You should not on any level endorse the idea of men consistently walking around and claiming that loving their women makes them somehow pathetic. That is dumb. What, am I supposed to be like you sitting around getting high and drunk all day, throwing away my money with kids that hate my guts with a thousand STDs and a, a shitty life? Is that what you want for me? I don't. I don't want those things for myself. I don't want those things for young black men. I want black men to understand, look, yes, you must have discernment when you pick your women. You can't go laying down with raggedy gold diggers. Yeah, you can't go around giving your best to every woman that walks by. But when you find that woman, when you find that woman that will love you, have your back and be there for you, then you better show up for her. Because if you don't, somebody else will. If you don't love your women, black men, white men and Italian men are going to come around with all their little romantic, wee wee, baby, you so beautiful. Think about this. There's so many black, and this is just a reality check. I don't know. Nobody talks about this, but I'm about to talk about it right now. Do you know how many black women I hear who say, gosh, I really want to be loyal to black men, but gosh, these, some of these, these Spanish men come around and they, they just love your dirty draws and they, they're so romantic and they don't that should embarrass you, man. You're losing the competition, bro. Stop that. Stop letting these rappers make you look stupid. So I'm I'm throwing my wife up here. She, I hope she don't get mad at me for putting the picture. But I'm sitting there like, you think that this lady married me because she ain't got no options. You don't think that she goes whenever she went to California or wherever that these white men and Italian men and Asian men and all kinds of men wasn't trying to hit on her. Get out of here, man. You know, yeah, as a black man, you are the prize. You know, I think we are the prize, but the, the black woman is the prize too. Because there are Italian men who can appreciate those fine curves and that nice, that nice, delicious booty. There are other men who see your women and they're starting to pluck them one by one because you have so many men that are still stuck in their juvenile stage and still run around acting like children. But only the grown-ass men are going to understand anything that I said. Call me a simp if you want to. Again, I don't care. But the other thing, too, I want to reiterate. 
if any of these guys want to debate me or want to have a conversation with me privately or publicly, I will talk to them. Corey, I will talk to him. This other guy whose channel I'm sharing, uh, I hope he does not mind me sharing this clip. I will talk to him. I'll talk on your platform. I'll talk on mine. There's not a single word that has ever come out of my mouth that I would not defend or would not explain. And there's not a word that comes out of your mouth that I would not listen to and acknowledge. I will acknowledge it. But at the same time, I'm going to stand my ground. That's 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 just what it is. So let me let me share a little bit more and then we're going to be done. OK, because I don't want to sit here and talk about this all day. And I promise you, everybody who are used to me doing other things, uh, I will get back to the regular schedule program after this. All right. I hate to agree. It's very sad. Like even that quick. And that's just one shot. I don't know. But her body language says a lot. Even D -line. Look at her shoulders. So the other thing, too, let me stop there. I don't know who these little sidekicks are on the court on Corey's show. I the, the, first of all, this lady, I think, you know, I, I think that she should really be careful because um I, I think I think I, I don't know. They just kind of look like like um Ed McMahon used to be on the Johnny Carson show and he all his job was was to laugh at all of Johnny's jokes. So these two as like the little sidekicks that just co-sign on anything he says they should understand just how kind of ridiculous that makes them look. But that was, that was just a quick thought about that, but let's keep going. She they knows, never lie. She knows it's about to happen. Everybody, anybody at that point with him. You ain't got to show this video no more. Cut the video off after this. That's we so see what's happening. This is a lane. Mr. 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 Watkins, I'm not mad at you. I actually feel sorry for you. You, you say you're a professional, but you say on the internet, oh, I met him, I never liked him. But everybody who real know, that's not what you said when you saw me. So then you say, I'm a comedian. Then he tried to bring black women into it. Uh -oh. We are, we are, we're supposed to come together. And okay, like, now now one thing I- all less predict. Now one thing I will say is, um, Corey is right. When I met him, I didn't like him. Um, I didn't say anything. I just shook his hand and he said something stupid. And I just kind of said, oh, that's a dumb comedian, immature, whatever, immature black man. I For that, actually, I should probably apologize because um, that wasn't very nice for me to say it. And, and uh, he's correct that that his his frustration with me never would have occurred had I not said that. I could tell he's hurt. Right. I could tell he's he's a little bit hurt. And that's, you know, when people lash out like that, this because they're hurt. And I should apologize for that. But I cannot apologize for telling my truth right i do I, I i was honest but maybe um one thing i haven't learned how to do very well is keep things to myself if i feel a certain way and i can say this is not the first time where i have hurt somebody's feelings and caused them to lash out because i told my truth uh it's you know and and, and i i'll say that when Corey said that thing about wishing death on his child's mother i was definitely a little triggered by that you know i saw it on willie's page and I just said, man, this is some bullshit. You know, we can't be out here wishing death on, like, if you wish death on the mother of your child, then that means you don't love your child. Because if you love your child, you love what your child loves. You know, your child, there's no person, your child on this earth is going to love more than their mother. So if I say I wish death on the mother of my child, even as a joke, that's not showing love for my child. And, uh, and so what I would encourage men, so first off, I'll say that between me and Corey, He's right. You know, I probably shouldn't have said it. I, 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 you know, for sure. But generally speaking, I will say to you as men, you know, I know you get frustrated. I know that your baby mama makes you mad. I know that you, um, you know, things happen. Child support sucks. Uh, I've gone through all that. I paid 18 years of child support. But one thing you have to do is always show respect to the mothers who gave life to your kids, you know, because without, like you, the only way your uh, DNA can survive, the only way you can genetically survive is through the body of a woman. So when a woman gives life to your kids, I want you to always balance that against any frustration you may have, because without her, you have no legacy. You have no nothing. Right. So um, I think that as men, it's really important that we don't get in the habit. Again, this is an embarrassing uh, this. This embarrasses us. You know, I want you to compare the status of black men to the status of men in other countries. You know, they they defend their women, they defend their families. And uh, and the fact that I got a fight to get men to understand this speaks to how they bastardized you. And they did it mostly through things like hip hop culture, 
systematic racism, mass incarceration, drugs, things like that. If you look at a lot of the young people that are on shows like Love and Hip Hop, most of those kids are traumatized. And most of them were traumatized. If you ask them, well, tell me about your upbringing. Most of them grew up in poverty. That's traumatic. Most of them grew up without a father. That's traumatic. Most of them grew up with parents on drugs. That's traumatic. A lot of them grew up with parents that were in prison. That's also traumatic. So all this trauma, 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 trauma is what creates the BET Awards. Right? You go to the BET Awards, everything is ghetto, ratchet, crazy, violent, ridiculous. Well, all that, what you're seeing there is you're seeing a virus. You're seeing the virus of untreated trauma. And we just, we're normalizing it because we don't think we deserve any better, right? So uh, so I would say to Corey, as a person who is in a position of leadership, because people listen to entertainers, studies show that black people listen to entertainers more than anybody else. That's why, for example, there's going to be some people that will never hear like my perspective uh, because I probably sound like I'm a hard ass or because I, I'm not as I, 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 don't, I, would, I don't tell jokes, right? Like Corey does um, and he's because he's good at it. But uh, but but really, at the end of the day, I think we all need to heal like th that, that trauma, which affected me, too. I'm, I'm heavily traumatized. So maybe who knows? Maybe I was triggered. I, in fact, I know I was triggered. I definitely get triggered by this issue. since so some of you have seen me get triggered. Uh, but also I have a therapist. Uh, my therapist helps me overcome that so that I can try to become a better person every step of the way, because it's, it's, it's hard out here being black. Being black is hard. You know, so uh, with so with that said, uh, that's where Corey's right. Um, you know, I shouldn't have said anything to him like that. But at the same time, I can't say I take it all back because it wasn't like I was making things up. So here we go. Well, you can't run that on the streets no more. My show is mainly a street show and other people who want to be down can come get involved. Yo shit that you running don't work on the streets. To be fair to boys, that's how boys is always going to be. Boys is always going to say, hey, we should be above this. We shouldn't be beat. But as I stated earlier, if boys wouldn't have made that comment, we wouldn't be here right now. Also, I think Dr. Walker needs to do so let's say let's go let's go back to this. Um, he says that his stuff is from the streets. Um, I know the streets. I, like I was born, you know. I I, I know what it's. There's no. There's probably nobody in this chat that can say that you were poorer than I was growing up. Um, I was born in the projects. Um, I have had many many relatives and friends uh, either killed on drugs or go to prison. Uh, every single cousin I grew up with. Uh, ended up in a really bad situation. Every single person that uh, I played with as a kid uh, ended up in a bad scenario. My best friend, Greg Wilkins, was shot in the head in front of his daughter when we were 25 years old. So uh, this whole line, this whole idea that somehow the streets um, is is foreign to everybody or just because you're not in the street and you don't choose to stay in the trap, that somehow you don't understand the trap. I think that's a, just a misconception. I think that uh, there's, a, there's people, a lot of you, in fact, give me a yes in the chat. How many of you grew up poor? How many of you grew up around dysfunction? How many of you grew up maybe in a single parent household? How many of you grew up in the hood? How many of you grew up maybe, uh, you know, seeing drug raids and drug addiction and incarceration, all that? Give me a yes in the chat. If you saw this growing up, a lot of you did, a lot of you did. And, uh, and so what I want people to really understand is that what I say, I want, I, I want to hear from intelligent black people. That ain't me saying I want to just hear from yuppies from the suburbs. You know, what I'm saying is that there are some of us who saw all of that shit, who went through all of that shit, who just said, I don't want no more of that shit. There are some of us who say, I don't want to continue a generational curse. I want to break it. There's some of us who say, yeah, my daddy wasn't there. Yeah, I, did. I saw drugs. That's why I don't mess with them. Yeah, I saw poverty. That's why I get my wealth right. Yeah, I, I saw ignorance. That's why I educate myself. Yeah, I saw violence. That's why I'm against it. Right. Now, some of you are, are connected to the black liberation struggle in a very special way because you you because you were hurt by it. You were affected by it. Right. So 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 when Corey says my show is for the streets. And, and those people over there, those uppity people over there, they don't know nothing about the streets. That's some bullshit. We probably know the streets better than you. We know enough about it to say we're going to get out of that nonsense. And that black people are not meant to just be street all the damn time. Black people are also meant to be CEOs. Black people are also meant to be lawyers. Black people are also meant to be astronauts. Black people are also meant to have wealth. Black people are also... Uh, not meant, and again, white folks taught you this. This is why the Democrats, first thing the Democrat Party does when they're trying to get black votes is they go to the streets because they're like, okay, we want to get these people in a tough situation, kill any hope that they have of a better life, 
so that they will bow down and simply give all their votes to the white man so that he'll go and save them. Right. You're waiting for Captain save a And I'm here to tell you, black people, ain't nobody going to save you if you don't save yourself. I'm here to tell you, black people, ain't black people ain't got no friends. You have no true allies. You have nobody that's ever going to help you fix the situation that's happening in your community until and unless your men stand up and start taking accountability. Uh, and black women, same thing for y'all, too. You know, again, I, I see the women when they make when they make these crazy choices uh, or they go through life with all this trauma and don't want to commit to any form of healing. Uh, you know, th it's all by design. So uh, so stop that bullshit about distinguishing between black people in the street versus black people who want to get out of the street or black people in the trap versus those who are trying to get out of the trap. We need to be connecting and talking and learning from each other. Right. That's what you that's what you really need, because believe me, the, the, the streets taught me everything I knew about getting my Ph.D. My father was directly from the streets. My father has killed people. My father has done it. Like, there ain't nothing about the streets. You could tell us that we don't know. We wouldn't be like, oh, my God. No, my father spent time as a criminal and as a cop. So so we know all about the streets. My lessons were from the streets. I was I remember driving through the streets with my dad and him saying, see that motherfucker over there? Yeah. Uh, see, see, he's on drugs. Yeah. yeah. Uh, he used to be the star of the football team. Uh, do you want to look like him when you grow up? No. Well, then stay away from drugs. That was how that was how my father taught me. So um, so stop that, you know, stop glorifying the trap. Any rapper or comedian or entertainer who talks about the trap should only be talking about the trap as a point of education on how to get out of it. Anybody in the community, pay attention now, I need y'all to hear this. Any entertainer who talks about the trap and glorifies it as a place that you want to be is an enemy of black people. He's either enemy, an enemy or he's simply he's, he's so misguided that he's simply working for the adversary in terms of keeping you exactly where they want you to be. So that means, you know, when you get rappers that rap about dealing dope like it's somehow wonderful and glamorous, that's an enemy of the black community. Anybody who raps about, you know, about black women being bitches and hoes and worthless or whatever, that's an enemy of the black community. Anybody who raps about killing black people as if that's a good thing. That's an enemy of the black community because these same damn rappers, these same damn people who will tell you uh, who will glorify the murder of a black person are the same sons of bitches that will show up at a rally talking about black lives matter, black lives matter. Well, black lives matter. You wouldn't be bragging about killing black people in your lyrics, you asshole. Seriously. I mean, I'm, I'm just I, I just need you all to understand the craziness of it, the hypocrisy of it, the ridiculousness of it. You know, so so don't tell me nothing about the streets, man. We we know the streets. Probably know the streets better than you do. I just I want people in the street to know that there's a place you can go where you won't get shot in your back. There's a place you can go where you won't have to be traumatized around every corner. There's a place where you can go where you can actually be happy and you don't have to compete in the trauma Olympics. That's what we do. Anybody ever seen this? Give me a yes if you've ever seen this. Where you have black people that'll be like. Like, well, you don't know what it's like to be black because you had you had a warm house and, and you had two parents and, and you had good food and, and you didn't have poverty. And, and, and uh, me, I grew up, we didn't have nothing. We didn't have no food in the house. And, and my daddy used to come in and kick everybody's ass. And, and I and my cousin got shot right in front of me. Like we, we literally think that being black means that you have to suffer. We don't even we, we think that black people who are not in a state of perpetual pain are somehow not black enough. I don't believe that. I don't want my children to be in pain. I don't want your children to be in pain. I don't want my children in the street. I don't want your children in the street. When I see black children that are headed for the street, I, I become instant daddy. I step up. Yeah, that if, if that makes me the simp, they call me the simp of the year because because I become instant daddy to that child. I step in as their father would, and I say, "What would their father say in this situation?" He would tell them, "No, man, don't do that. Don't do that. That's gonna put you. That's gonna get you locked up. You're gonna become a white man's bitch. He's gonna put you in prison for a hundred years. It's terrible. Don't do that." Right. So what? So all I'm saying is, <sighs> can the grown men in the black community please stand up? Seriously, can the grown ass men? Who understand, you know, especially guys from the street, you know, the guys who uh, who were in the street, who saw the trauma, who saw the violence, who uh, went through hell, maybe went to prison, 
maybe, uh, you know, maybe got shot by a cop at some point, maybe whatever you went through, grew up without a father. Can you reflect on what you went through and just make a commitment to me that we're going to do as much as we can to make sure that the next generation doesn't have to go through that. Like when I see, when I watch the BET Awards, there's a part of me that gets frustrated because I'm, I become the older old man shaking his fist in the air. Like what the hell is this shit? But part of me feels so sorry for those poor children because a lot of them are in their twenties and, uh, and they were just put through so much hell that you see it everywhere. Like you see the battle scars everywhere, like, like the cover with tattoos and doing crazy ratchet stuff and drinking yourself into an early grave and, and all I see is pain. I just see unhealed pain. I see almost like a, a, a zombie virus. I, you know, and and I, I feel bad for those kids because because they went through some shit. They, that's why they're acting like that because they went through the trauma Olympics. And I just want things to be better for them. I want them to to know that you can go and you can heal yourself. You know, it's like when um did anybody see that video where they had that rapper Young Miami who was literally calling herself a whore. She said, "I'm a whore with a W." And then uh, Jason Lee, shout out to Jason Lee. Jason Lee says, um, well, what about your daughter? She's pretty. Summer, what uh, What if she wants to be a city girl? And she instantly froze up. She's like, some, no, no, some ain't going to be no city girl. Some ain't going to be no city girl. So, so she didn't want her daughter to do exactly what her mother is doing. That right there is a red flag. That right there tells you that you know that what that the way you're living your life, you're, you're being cool, you, you, you know, you're down with the streets. But even you know that that is some messed up shit. You know, you're right. even she knows it. Like that's her, and that's the conflict. That's her motherly instinct kicking in the same man. Maybe I don't want my daughter slide down a stripper pole and sleeping with a man for, for two dollars and a bag of Cheetos. Maybe that you know, and, and and that that's the the conflict. And what I'm saying is, the reason you're feeling that conflict is because you're learning. She's learning right right in front of everybody. I can see her processing information. She's learning that this culture is not good for you. That and, and think about this. It, it, the only reason that this culture seems flashy and cool is because it's on TV and you're getting paid to live this way. And what I want you to do is I want you to look at the life that you're living. Look at the life some of these entertainers are living and take away all the money and all the fame and then ask, is that still a good life? Like you look at R. Kelly's life where he was raping little girls and shitting on people and doing all this crazy stuff. God, only God knows R, what R. Kelly was doing. Right. If you it, 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 it seemed OK, because R. Kelly had he was, he was selling a million records a year and he had, you know, a 10 million dollars in the bank and he could sing like a bird. And he was a tall, handsome, good looking man who had lots of women. Take away all of that. Take away all the money, all the fame, all the women, all the all all the, the status. And what you see is a degenerate human being who's who's really slowly working his way to a life of incarceration and an early death. That's what it really was. And that's what Hollywood does. This is why you got to be really careful about putting your children in the entertainment space. Hollywood is a place of tremendous uh, debauchery, but it gets covered up. They take a piece of shit and they put chocolate icing on it and you think it's a chocolate cake. But then when you cut through the cake, you realize it's just a bunch of shit. Don't put your children in the, a bunch of shit. Make sure that they are happy. So um, anyway, let me finish here uh, with this. Uh, do me a favor, hit the thumbs up button, thumbs up, share, subscribe. Just a reminder, uh, my name is Dr. Boyce Watkins, and my new book is called The Ten Commandments of Black Economic Power. It's a bestseller on Amazon, so if you'd like to get a copy, feel free to do that. Or you can go to boycewatkins.com. If your goal is to learn about economics at a higher level, I have plenty of free resources for you. We've helped. We've gotten over a billion views pretty much on YouTube and other places and because our goal is to make B1 people, uh, those who care about the black community, make us the most economically intelligent group of people on the planet. So if you go to boycewatkins.com, I have a list of stocks that you can buy to help you make money. Even those who don't like me, you can still go there and I still welcome you. Uh, there's plenty of free resources there. There's a training called How to Make Money Without Working. Feel free to take a look at all that. It's all on my website, boycewatkins.com. Also, we're on Spotify. Uh, and if you look up my name, Boyce Watkins on Spotify, you can find it there. Last but not least, uh, if you text the word uh, Boyce, to 31996, text voice to 31996, and you can get text notifications when I go live, you know, stuff like that. All right, so um, the, let me, let me say, I, I wanted to finish uh, getting a chance to hear everything Corey had to say, and I reiterate to Corey and his crew, if y'all want me to come back on 5150, I'll do it. I know Zoe, uh, it's been a while since I've been on the show. I'd be more than happy to come in and have this conversation. So let's see, let's play this. A better job at knowing his opposition. This is a street show, homie. We, I ain't saying this all villains as some of you would try and make it seem like if you 
if you claim the streets, you a villain. No, we the people who out here in the elements making something out of nothing. That's my audience. That's my audience. That's right. Truck drivers, people who really out here making life work without the tools they should be given. So you can try and make it seem like something wrong with me all you want, but I'm here to tell you, you made a fool out of yourself proposing to somebody who didn't really want you. Now, I'm not saying she didn't wind up choosing you. I mean, we later in life. Her choices ain't that much out there. All she can do is fuck with me. I'm going to take her to the mall to buy a couple of outfits. Um, now that, um, go back to that. <laughs> what? No, that picture outside. I just looked up. Now that true religion ain't that expensive, I can have her out there fly. <laughs> I forgot about true religion. She looked at him like, I'm, oh, not, I'm not kidding. Look at any back point, to the video. Any, any woman, if you're excited for the one that you love, is hey. finally popping the question, you would be ecstatic I ain't never seen no over woman. the moon. I, She's I like, I don't see if tell the nigga no it was more excited. She's like, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Homie, this ain't the one you want to go after. You can try to rally the black people against me. That's what they always do. Oh, he doesn't like black women and all this shit. If I said I wish my baby mama was dead, I stand on it and got some evidence that'll make motherfuckers be like, oh, I see why he think like that. The bitch try to hit me with a car. And what's messed up is what her shirt says. So sound like she wish what does her shirt say? Just keep moving. <laughs> That's God right there. Oh, it ain't no coincidence her shirt say just keep moving. That let me know you ain't sharp as I thought you were. Okay, so let, let's let's stop right there. Um, first thing is, I want to point out that, um, and this is important for you guys to understand who you should be getting relationship advice from. Um, and there's, there's different types of advice, right? There's guys that can tell you um, how to get a woman to sleep with you. Um, and, you know, that that's out there. But then, which is important, right, at some point in your life. Then there's also advice on how to find a woman that's really going to work for you. And uh, one of the things I would say is that uh, you really want to be careful about getting advice from older men who are not happy in their relationships. And so when Corey says uh, the bitch tried to run me over with a car, I want to ask you all a question. How many of you have been in a relationship with somebody that tried to run you over with a car? Hey, give me a yes. Give me a yes or no. How many of you have been in a relationship with somebody who tried to run you over with a car? Yes or no? All right. So, so, so the the reason I bring this up, and um, and again, I like to I like to bring things up like this because I think everything can be an educational point. Is that that's really him telling you that he does not make good relationship choices? That's him telling you that I'm not good at picking quality women. Um, in fact, yes or no, ladies. And I'm gonna ask this question, to ladies. How many of you have ever tried to run someone over with a car? Give me a yes or no if you've ever thought about doing that. And uh, and, and I bet there's going to be a lot of no's in the chat. Um, and, and so the element that you spend your time around is going to play a big part in the types of women that you attract. And so Corey and I, I, I like to believe that we're both good at what we do. Um, you know, I do what I do. He does what he does. I think, again, I think he's good. He's a funny, he's a funny comedian. I, I would watch a Corey Holcomb show and I would laugh. Like, I, I really, I, I, I will say that. Um, so in fact, it's out of respect for him that I'm addressing the issue, right. That I'm even addressing him. Uh, but the thing is that there's a difference in terms of the types of quality of people that you attract, right? So if you're an entertainer or comedian, you are going to attract a lot of, you know, gold digging, low vibrational strippers and you know, women that'll sleep with you for money. Um, I operate in a more intellectual space. The women that I attracted were women who made straight A's, who uh, who had advanced degrees, who had plenty of money in the bank, you know, stuff like that. And uh, and that was very deliberate. You know, I, I I didn't want low quality women around that were going to do things that, you know, might kill me or or embarrass me in a significant way. Uh, in fact, you know, with my wife, I chose my wife partly because she had class. I met other women that were pretty like her. Um, cause when you get money and you go places and you're traveling around the world, you meet, you just, honestly, there's too many options. It was too many options. Uh, and, uh, and I, I can think of a time where there was a woman that I met that was actually in LA who, um, where Corey lives, who I thought might be somebody I could, uh, approach. And, uh, but I did something, you know, that I, I encourage guys to do, which is, I just watched, I just observed her behavior for a long time. When you're a King and you're trying to build an empire, you got to watch who you let into your kingdom. Uh, because a lot of times the kingdom can be destroyed from the inside out. So I just observed her behavior. And then one day I saw her just say some stuff on social media that was this damn embarrassing. 
And I remember thinking, okay, um, thank you, God, for giving me the, the discernment to take my time with this woman before I go and let her into my life. And so the reason that you got to be cautious about getting advice from a guy like a Corey is Corey tells you, I had a child with a woman who tried to murder me, who tried to run the bitch, tried to run me over with a car. So that's why I'm wishing death on her. So basically, that's not really love. That's war. That's not black love. That's black war. And a lot of black relationships end up like that because y'all guys have never been taught to not sit around and trust a big button, a smile. Some of y'all are will still be so impressed by a woman's ass, her titties or the sex that she gives you on the first date that you'll go and put your seed inside this woman. And the next thing you know, you got a baby's mama who's crazy, who hates you, who's a terrible human being. And you are in that situation in many cases because nobody, your daddy never sat you down and taught you about sexual discipline. You ain't got to put your penis in every single thing that is offered to you. You don't do that. So, so that, so that's what I was saying about that. And, and also just generally speaking, don't get relationship advice from men who are not happy with their relationships. You, you don't, you don't do that. You know, if, if I'm pissed off at all my baby's mamas, but then I'm turning around telling you, yeah, you know, let, you know don't, don't be messing with these hoes. And da, 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 da. What, what qualifies me to give you anybody relationship advice if I'm not happy with my relationship? Uh, you know, and, and, you know, and, and also with, with my wife, um, you know, th th again, another misperception that, that people, some people ran with, and I never cleared it up, but I, I would clear it up today. A lot of people think that we didn't get married until later because uh, somehow she just swerved me and shaded me. My wife has said on many occasions on our pillow talk, just in casual conversation, she said, Boyce, if you had asked me out, I would have gone out with you. Um, and uh, truth be told, I wouldn't have been ready for marriage in my 20s. And this is a tip for ladies. You know, sometimes you got to let men kind of work through their young boy stage before they're really ready to be mature enough to, to have a family. So um, ideally, I think like, for example, if you have, say, a 37 year old man with, say, a, a 29, 30 year old woman, I think that works pretty well. Um, when you have a 29 year old man or 28 year old man and a 28 year old woman, you still might be running into some challenges in terms of him not working out uh, his his sexual energy. Right. If you will. Right. So so I would say to you that, um, you know, most of the, the the men that are giving relationship advice, I invite them, you know, like this, the guy whose uh, channel this is on, the Mr. Goodbread guy. I don't know much about him, um, but I would encourage him to be careful about feeding into the anxieties and the frustrations of men by telling them that women are all fucked up. You know, um, I think that that is um, that's kind of where what Derek Jackson did with women. Derek Jackson would tell women that the reason you don't have a good man is because men are this and men are that. So really, to some extent, it's two sides of the same coin. It's almost like um, it's like feminism. It's feminism for men. Basically, when you have a man who gets online and just says women are this, women are that, women don't do this, women don't do that. But we don't talk about anything in terms of men that we got to fix. And uh, and and I I just think and I know it's not popular and and, and I know that a lot of people aren't going to appreciate it or, or understand it because it's easier to talk to somebody who tells you what you want to hear. But if you're not holding yourself accountable the way you're holding women accountable or vice versa, then you're not going to get anywhere. You're just going to sit around. You're going to be pissed off because uh, think about it. Most of these guys that run around talking about women's standards are too high. These are just men who simply didn't pick women in their pay grade. Their chances are. If the woman that you wanted didn't want you, there's probably some other woman who did want you, but you didn't want her. So you you shop in, in a, a grocery store aisle with products that you can't afford. That's it. Or you're trying to apply for jobs where your resume doesn't meet the credentials of that job. You know, do you get what I'm saying? Like, like if I constantly am saying, well, these employers, their expectations are too high. They they want you to work 20 hours a week and, and they don't they don't want to pay more than more than a hundred thousand a year. And, and they don't I mean, if you're not qualified for the job, then you're not going to get the job. But that doesn't mean nobody's qualified for the job. That doesn't mean that their standards are too high. That just means that the standards were too high for you. Do y'all understand the difference? There's a difference between me saying to a woman or a man or anybody, your, your standards are too high. No, I'm saying what I'm really saying, again, when people talk about other people, they're really talking about themselves. When I say women's standards are too high, what I'm really saying is that I can't meet the standard of the woman that I want. And I'm pissed off about it. So I would say to men and women, because I hear from both men and women, 
if the person you want has a standard that's too high for you, turn around and pick somebody that where well, you do meet the standard. There are, um, you know, there are good women out here that would, would that, you know, she may not be uh, the Instagram model where you've been DMing her and begging her for her time and attention. But guess what? That Instagram model has 10,000 dudes in her inbox and you're just not the one who wins the competition. And uh, and so so for men and women, I think that there's like that misperception of what the mistake I see a lot of women make is they don't understand the difference between a man wanting to have sex with you versus a man really wanting to love you. They don't understand that. They they think that their selection pool, when they get to picking a husband, they don't understand that that's different from picking a baby daddy or picking a sex partner. Uh, when you pick a sex partner, your, your, your pool of options is like this. It's massive. When you pick a husband, it's kind of like that. Because a lot of your sex partners are not willing to be your husband. Do you follow what I'm saying? So a lot of the guys that will get in the bed with you and give you the best sex ever, when you then say, okay, I want to elevate, I want a promotion in the company, I don't want to be in the mailroom anymore, I want to be the CEO, he's going to be like, ah, you know, in the mailroom we have 50 available spots, but we can only have one CEO. You understand? And so what happens, and, and this is real life, I've seen this happen, this is this is my life, um, is that when you pick one woman that you choose to marry, guess what? There's a whole bunch of other women that are sitting around saying, well, what was wrong with me? What was, Why didn't he pick me? And it's not that he didn't pick you because there's something wrong with you. He, he just didn't pick you because he can only pick one. If there's only one spot, it's like if you watch the uh, the finals of the men's 100 meter dash in the Olympics, there are 10 of the fastest human beings on the planet all lining up to win one gold medal. You get what I'm saying? Follow, tell me, give me a yes if you understand my analogy here. There's 10 men lined up or 10 women lined up, fastest human beings on the planet. Uh, you know, again, they start off with 100. They weeded it down to 10. At the end of that race, there's only going to be one winner. So imagine this. Imagine if the, the race was run and one guy wins the, the, the gold medal, Fred, Fred Curley. He's one of my favorite track athletes. He, he wins the gold medal. And then imagine if the guy who got fourth place is, is looking at the same, man, what's wrong with me? I must be slow. I must not be that fast. That's not true. He's very fast. You're very fast. You just weren't the winner. So a lot of women will do that when it comes to the marriage Olympics. They'll, they'll see a man, pick a woman and marry her. And they'll say, well, what was wrong with me? Why didn't you pick me? And, uh, and I had a conversation like that with a woman many years ago. This actually happened in my life. And I explained to her, I said, no, 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 you were great. You're going to be a great wife for somebody, but I can only pick one. If I could pick five of you, then you'd be a top five, but I can't, I have to pick one. That's the rule. So there's nothing wrong with you. You just weren't the one I selected. So, uh, so a lot of times I think women, when they are picking, I think that sometimes what happens is you throw away the man who would have been willing to commit to you so you can chase the man who ain't committing to shit. Do you understand what I'm saying? Like literally you're chasing a guy who has made it clear I'm not committing to nobody. I, I got eight girlfriends on deck. I'm trying to manage all of them. I'm not trying to sit down and, and focus and center everything on one. But then you got the other guy. Maybe he's the truck driver or he's the bus driver or whatever, or, or he's the hardworking accountant who's not as flashy. He ain't got maybe he ain't got as much money. Maybe he's not a chick magnet like the other dude. And you're looking you're not interested in him because he's boring or you feel like he's not your best selection. But you can't pick you can't pick a spouse the same way you pick a sex partner. <laughs> Every man's going to volunteer to be your sex partner, but very few men are going to volunteer to be your spouse. And sometimes I would argue that it's 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 a self-esteem issue that causes you to reject the men who love you the most because you're used to chasing the men that make themselves the least available for two reasons. One, because we tend to think things are more valuable when they're not available. That's an immaturity thing too. Once you mature, you kind of say, well, man, why am I chasing something that doesn't want me? Right. But when you're less mature, you tend to chase things that you can't have. But then also, um, if you grew up without love and esteem, then what happens is I think is that when you see a man who says, I love you, I think you're great. I want to take you out. I want to be nice to you. You look at him, you say, well, what's wrong with him? He must be a simp. He must, something has got to be wrong with him if he likes me, because who in the hell would ever really love me? Right. And uh, and, and I really think that that's um, because uh, I heard a woman say that I heard a woman say that she that she met a man and he sent her um, a gift card 
for a spa treatment. He said, hey, you deserve a day off. You know, I want you to know I'm interested in you. He started pursuing her and he said, hey, here's a here's a, a gift card for a spa for you to go and get, you know, a facial and have a nice relaxing day off. And she literally was like, oh, God, ugh, I don't want that. Like, you know, and, and, and an older woman was like, girl, what are you talking about? That man's making his intentions known. He's letting you know, I like you. I want to pursue you. So so think about this. So she turns down the guy who is pursuing her so she can go after the guy who doesn't want her. Do, do you are you surprised when she ends up in an abusive relationship or gets mistreated? Because he told you from the jump, I don't really like your ass that much, but yet somehow you want to, because maybe because you're chasing your missing daddy or something deep down, um, you're chasing this person despite all that, and then you end up in a terrible situation. So um, this is my conclusion on this. I'm going to finish up this discussion here. Uh, everybody, I believe everybody needs therapy. I, I believe everybody needs therapy. I think that um, men, a lot of men are angry because uh because women have changed the world has changed masculinity has da been damn near made illegal uh and uh and so the world is constantly telling men how to be men i think men should reject that but also i think men are angry uh because uh you know some i don't know somehow you've got this thing in your head uh that that women are supposed to give you what you want bow at your feet or Instagram models that you're chasing are supposed to want you. And they maybe don't, maybe they don't want to date a bus driver. They want to date a guy that's got money or whatever, right? I don't know. I don't know. Whatever happened to you. Uh, but then I think a lot of women are angry because the men are not showing up for them. They, they see video where a woman, a black woman gets punched in the head five times by a black man and not one single black man steps up to protect that woman. Uh, and, and this starts even going back to when she was a little girl and her father wasn't there to protect her. So she feels unprotected by black men. But um, so so really, I would almost say to you that if you want to get out of the bullshit and you want to get out of the nonsense, uh, get some healing, get some therapy because you've probably been traumatized. That will make you better. And then when you're showing up better, when you become better, don't let someone reinfect you with that virus of niggerosity. Like, don't spend time. Like, if you're a quality woman, if you've made yourself into this quality woman who can appreciate a good man, don't give that love to men who don't deserve it. Save yourself for the men that deserve you, that, that are going to meet you at that level. And the same thing is true for men. When you are a man and you've done your healing and you've learned how to uh, get rid of you know some of these emotions that, that make you weak, like jealousy or 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 whatever. You got your money right. You've been uh, investing in yourself. You're taking care of yourself. Stay away from low vibrational, low quality women. You know, go places where you're going to meet the kind of woman that's going to be worthy of continuing your legacy in a meaningful way. A, a woman who's going to respect everything that you worked hard to accomplish. Who isn't going to ruin what you're trying to do in your life. She's going to actually add to it. There are quality women out there like that, but you got to learn to get mature enough to look past just what she looks like, the big button, the smile. Uh, and, and that's, a, there's a difference. You know, I can tell you when I was younger, a, a pretty girl came along. I would, I would be attracted to the pretty girl just like that. Right. But then as I got older and I saw how some pretty, some, some, you know, toxic energy can come in, in very pretty packages. I got older and now, and then I got to the point where I turned down pretty girls all the time. There were pretty women. I'm telling you, I, I kid you not. You, you should see my life. It just, it say, seems weird, you know, cause I'm, cause I'm a professor, right? That's it's kind of a nerdy thing, right? But believe me, when you got money and status, pretty girls just instantly believe that you're some kind of a great catch. And, uh, and so I turned down a lot of beautiful women because I was looking at their soul. I would have a conversation and say, okay, you're not very smart. Or I would look at what she, how she treated other people. And I would say, no, she's not a very nice person. So I would see through all of that. And then I, what I would do is say, okay, I don't even want to be tempted by all that beauty and all that lusciousness you got. So I don't even want to be in your, in the same room with you because I don't want to end up in a bad situation, but this requires you to heal and understand what's where your deficits are because um I have a friend who um who was <clears throat> a successful guy he he makes probably six figures <clears throat> and uh he's very smart too he's really highly educated and he had a baby with a stripper and uh and he and all he does is complain about his baby's mama all he does is complain about how she's this and she's that and she does this stupid stuff and does that stupid stuff and I I listen to him and I feel bad for him and I the reason I feel bad for him is I say gosh it's too bad that you didn't have enough sexual discipline to learn not to put your penis inside a stripper. Uh, it, Cause if you had kept your penis to yourself, 
you wouldn't be having uh, a baby's mama who's going who's sliding down stripper poles, you know. But but that's bothering you and it's embarrassing you and it's upsetting you because you never learned one of the most important things a man can develop: discipline. If you can't develop discipline, bro, you're gonna lose it all. You'll never have anything. Discipline, um, that means you need to start listening to people like David Goggins, who's like the king of discipline. He's super a disciplined guy. You need to start listening to men who have who have accomplished the things that you want to accomplish, not just these dudes that sound good and look good on the Internet. You know, I, anybody can get on the Internet and look cool. Anybody can get on the Internet and sound cool. Anybody can get on the Internet and tell you what you want to hear. You need to listen to people that are going to really teach you the true essence of manhood without distorting it with either hyper masculinity or undisciplined behavior, right? If you, if you know, if, for any man, this is, and, and this is a rare breed. This is not every man. There, some men, you know, just maybe aren't ready. I don't know. But for any man that really wants to succeed, that wants to win, that wants to compete, I encourage you, like, just understand that some of these guys are losing, you know, and I'm not saying Corey's a loser. I, I don't know much about his personal life. Again, Corey, you can call me. We'll, we'll talk and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll be your friend now uh, or something. That would be really cool, right? If we got together as friends and just said, okay, yeah, I was fucking with you. You're fucking with me. Now let's, let's, let's be cool with each other. I'm okay with that. But, um, but, but, but in general, I just really, when I, I like, I can see through weak men, like, just like that, just like I can see toxic women, just like that. And, uh, and unfortunately in your community, and I attribute a lot of this to white supremacy, they tend to promote and elevate the most screwed up people because they don't really want you to be strong and successful and disciplined. They want you to be weak and broken and destroyed and disrupted so that they can easily control you. So uh, that's my two cents, guys. Uh, I know that this was a controversial topic. And, and those of you who said I shouldn't have addressed it, I get it. I hear you. Maybe I shouldn't. Maybe I just, maybe that was messed up for me to talk about it, but the good Lord told me to talk about it. So I did. And now it's done. Now I'm going to get back to your regu regular schedule program a little bit later. All right. So do me a favor, hit the thumbs up button on your way out. Thumbs up, share, subscribe. Uh, this podcast is on Spotify. Uh, please make sure you subscribe and hit the notification bell. Uh, also, if you want to get text notifications when we go live, just text the word voice to 31. 996 uh text voice to 31996 and also if you want your kids to learn about things like wealth and economics we do have financial flashcards for children uh you can go to financialflashcards.com it'll put your kids ahead of the curve and because like i said i want our little boys and little girls to be able to compete and uh, the way you help them compete is you help them get their money right at an early age they get their money right that's going to make a lot of difference in terms of their uh level of happiness and fulfillment and completion and strength in this world uh they want you broke busted and disgusted i don't want you in that place. I want you to win. So let's get out here and win. So God bless you guys. Have a great day. I'll see you soon and uh, talk to you later. Have a good day. Peace. Here we are, clan the isms, cataclysm, great. Our people out here struggling, trying to make it in this state. Everybody out here doing it, but we the ones who late. Now, family, we the ones who gotta delegate. Get that money in the power, never be fake. Stick to co sign for three. What did he say? Uh, create jobs, support our own. Educate the same and buy back your home. Got three degrees, triple ten. Three PhDs, now we on the CNN. DBTV, let's talk about negligence. Ignorance is bliss, but we can turn it to intelligence. Please none of what you hear, half of what you see. Let's break it down here on Dr. Boyce TV.